Hello, beautiful friends and bookish fam. My name is Brittany. This is Rescues and Reads. Thank you so much for joining me here today for another Bookmas video. If you are new, welcome. I'm so glad to have you here. And if you are a returning subscriber, thank you so much for your continued support and for returning to another video. Today, I have some winter book recommendations for you. Now, last year for Bookmas, I actually did an entire video completely dedicated to nothing but wintry isolation thrillers. Those are my favorite subgenre of thrillers, and I had a bunch to talk with y'all about. And so, for the sake of reducing repetitiveness, I am not going to be talking about any of the books that I featured in that video. I still stand by those recommendations. And so, if you are interested in wintry isolation thrillers for this time of year, please feel free to check out that video, which I will leave linked down below for your convenience. Today, I have a fairly wide variety of books to talk to you about today, and that's that is because I feel like winter vibes actually encompasses a lot of different themes and genres. You know, whether you have the typical cozy, heartwarming type of story, maybe you have a sweet Hallmark romance. I also feel like winter is a really good time to kind of sink your teeth into a chunky fantasy. So there is a lot that I feel go into books that give you those winter vibes and the atmosphere that you are looking for this time of year. So I think I might have a little bit of something for everyone and I'm just going to go ahead and dive in. I'm really not talking about these in any particular order, just kind of in the order that I've written them down in. I will try to keep like books kind of grouped together for some semblance of organization. But aside from that, we're just going to go ahead and jump right in. So first, let's go ahead and start off with the tried and true, a classic, a book that is typically recommended for this time of year for those Christmas holiday wintry vibes, A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. This one is very shiny, so I apologize if I am currently blinding you. There we go. So I think we all know the story of A Christmas Carol where Ebenezer Scrooge, an old curmudgeon, is visited by three ghosts, the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future, kind of showing him the error of his ways and trying to get him to change change them. This has been adopted multiple times and so if you are interested in the story but you've never actually read the original it is very short. It is only 83 pages and it can easily be read in one day if not one sitting and even though I enjoy most of the adaptations more than I actually enjoy the original story I do think that it is actually worth the read but if you are not actually interested in reading the original story I do have a retelling that I would like to include in this video as well and that is The Afterlife of Holly Chase by Cynthia Hand. This was such an amazing YA retelling of A Christmas Carol and I highly recommend for all of those who enjoy the story but may not want to read the original. So this follows our main character Holly Chase. She basically undergoes the same experience as Ebenezer Scrooge. She is not the most likable girl so she's kind of presented with the three ghosts in order to change her ways. When she doesn't change her ways her life is basically taken from her and she is basically drafted into Project Scrooge and every year Project Scrooge basically picks an Ebenezer to focus on for a year and they let them undergo the Scrooge experience. So basically for a year they get to know this Ebenezer, what they like, what they don't like, all of their past experiences and they use that to curate the perfect Scrooge experience with the ghosts of past, present, and future. I just thought that this was such a wonderful retelling. I thought that it was very creative and clever and there is a nice little twist at the end that you really don't see coming. So if you enjoy YA stories, if you're looking for a holiday related read, if you're even just looking for a Christmas Carol retelling, I highly recommend this one. This was just charming and delightful and I really don't think that you can go wrong with it. Next let's go ahead and talk about romances. Now obviously I could certainly feature all of the holiday rom-coms and romances that come out during this time of year. There are an absolute ton of them. There is no limit to the selection that you could possibly choose from. I did actually post a video, I think it might have been in October, of all of the new holiday releases that were coming out at the end of 2023 alone. So please feel free to check out that video if you are interested in some of those. And of course, even if you just Google holiday reads or things like that, you are going to come up with plenty of options. So I'm really not going to be talking about a lot of those here. I just have a couple of notable romances that I think encompass winter vibes very, very well and so those are the ones that I'm going to be featuring. Of course starting with one of my very favorite romances of all time, The Simple Wild by K.A. Tucker. If you have been on my channel for any length of time you are no stranger to this book and my feelings on it. This is a grumpy sunshine hate to love romance that follows our main character Kala and she was actually born in Alaska but when she was just two years old her mother who was completely fed up of living in the Alaskan wild and dealing with the absence of her husband Ren who was a bush pilot. He owned his own company and he was gone for long periods of time and he had a very dangerous job. She couldn't handle it anymore so Kala's mother took her to live in Toronto. And that is where Kala has grown up. She hasn't really seen her father since then and I believe it was when she was in middle school but they had kind of a falling out and she hasn't spoken to him since the start of this book. She's in her mid-20s and all of a sudden she receives a call from a woman she doesn't know that says Kala your father is sick and you need to come see him and she realizes that this could be the last opportunity that she has to actually get to know her father and so she flies out to Alaska and when she is flying out there she meets Jonah who is a burly grumpy bush pilot who actually works for her father Ren and he immediately dislikes Kala. He has absolutely no time for her. He thinks that she is a spoiled high maintenance 
finds a city slicker and he doesn't want anything to do with her. He also doesn't really understand the dynamic that she has with Ren because he kind of views Ren as a father figure and so he doesn't understand how she can just waste the opportunities that she's had with him as a father. So he is very judgmental of her and in all honesty she's kind of judgmental of them and their lifestyle because she's very much used to the city life, having a Starbucks on every corner, having all of those conveniences. And so it is really about them learning who each other really are and of course it's also about a love story that develops between Jonah and Kala but it is about so much more because it is also about family dynamics and Kala getting to know her father before it is too late. I just thought that this was wonderful. It was beautiful. It was touching. There are definitely depictions of grief and loss in this story but again this is set in the wilds of Alaska. I definitely feel like even though this book isn't necessarily set in winter all of the time you definitely get the vibes and the feel from the Alaskan wilds that you would want to experience during this time of year. So if you are looking for a cozy kind of harder hitting romance this is one for you. And then the last official romance that I want to talk to you about is probably one that has definitely come across your radar in these types of recommendations videos but I absolutely love this story and so I couldn't make this video without talking about it. One Day in December by Josie Silver. So this follows our main character Lori and one day she is on her way home from work. She's on London's public transportation system and a bus is pulling into a bus stop and through the bus window she locks eyes with a man who is waiting at the bus stop and there seems to be kind of like this instant spark, this instant attraction between the two and it is so strong and it is so powerful that this man actually tries to get on her bus even though it is not his but of course he just narrowly misses. And for the next year she and her roommate Sarah kind of become obsessed with bus boy and they're trying to track him down even though they know absolutely nothing about him. And one day he re-enters her life but not in the way that she's expecting because he actually comes home one day and she is introduced to him as Jack, Sarah's boyfriend. And of course she is not going to say anything to Sarah about the fact that he is bus boy. And she remembers Jack vividly and he actually remembers her but neither one of them discuss this. So you're following them as they kind of build a friendship between each other over the several years that he and Sarah are in a relationship but meanwhile both of them are remembering their bus stop experience and there is definitely chemistry and attraction between the two and so you're following them over the course of 10 years. So this definitely starts on that one day in December when they are locking eyes at the bus stop but it doesn't only take place in December or the holiday season because you are following them over 10 years but I definitely do consider this kind of like a wintry slash holiday type of romance but I really really enjoyed this one so I wanted to go ahead and recommend it here in case you have never heard of it or never read it before. She actually has a new release that just came out. I think it was back in October that I'm excited to try as well. So that book actually might be featured in a future winter recommendations video. Who knows? Now I want to switch gears for a second and return to the wild of Alaska but in a book that is very different, The Great Alone by Kristen Hanna. So this is a historical fiction that is set in the 1970s and this is definitely a darker story. This is not warm. This is not cozy. This is not heartwarming. This is not a romance. This follows a family, a mother, father, and a daughter and the father is a Vietnam War veteran who is suffering from PTSD. He has a lot of issues and he has made the decision to up and relocate his family to Alaska. He thinks that that is going to solve everything and once they are there they are going to be happy. Everything is going to be perfect. Ert is a very angry kind of volatile man and yes he does abuse his family and so he does up and relocate them to Alaska and at first everything is great during the long Alaskan summers but what they don't account for are the harsh Alaskan winters. So you're basically following the deterioration of this family as Ert becomes more volatile, more violent, more angry, and the survival that happens between the mother and the daughter. So this is definitely a darker story. This truly encompasses winter in the harshest form. There's a lot of desperation and desolation that occurs in this story. They are in rural Alaska. They are in survival mode in more ways than one, right? They're trying to survive Ernt, but they're also trying to survive just the Alaskan winter. They come up there very unprepared. They have no idea what it means to actually survive for an Alaskan winter. So I feel like the atmosphere in this is a huge character. It plays a big role in the story. And that's one of the things that I fully attribute to winter is the atmosphere. When I say a winter atmosphere, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Snowy, dark, freezing cold. All of that stuff is wonderfully depicted in here, but also what is wonderfully depicted in here are the family that kind of the mother and daughter in the story build in Alaska who are willing to help them. So there are definitely sweet and touching and happy moments in this story, but y'all know that Kristen Hanna is a literary heartbreaker and this one is no different. So if you are looking for a more substantial read this holiday season, I am certainly going to recommend this. This one is definitely a top tier recommendation from me if you are looking for one of those more serious darker reads for the winter. I do also have one. It is actually a dark academia. It is my favorite dark academia and it is one that I'm sure that you are all familiar with If We Were Villains by ML Rio. Now I know a lot of people typically associate dark academia with the mystery thriller genre and so they typically associate it more with autumnal slash Halloween vibes. However, I actually do believe that dark academia probably both equally encompasses autumnal and winter vibes because I consider dark academia to be very very chilling because when I think of dark academia I think of very wealthy foreboding prestigious institutions like Yale and Harvard 
Those are typically set in climates that can get very cold in the winter, Boston, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and things like that. So I'm just picturing these institutions in the middle of a snowstorm. That's kind of the vibes that I get from a lot of dark academia. And this is no different. So this follows our main character, Oliver. And at the very beginning of the story, he has just been released from prison after 10 years. And there is a detective, the one that kind of worked on the case and put him in prison, who wants to know what happened 10 years prior. And 10 years prior, Oliver was part of a very small group of elite Shakespearean students at this private classical conservatory. It was a very close-knit friend group and one of them ends up dead and Oliver gets pinned for the crime. So you're getting the present day perspective after he has been released from prison and then you're also getting flashbacks to the past. You're getting to know the friend group and what actually happened. I actually kind of feel like this might be a perfect transitional book to transition you from fall to the winter season because it's definitely an atmospheric, dark, chilling mystery. So I just think that this is the perfect transition book for this time of year. Y'all know that this is my favorite dark academia and I will always recommend it. So I wanted to go ahead and include it in here. Now really quickly, this next stack, I'm not going to go into too terribly many details about each of these books here, but they all have one thing in common in that they are all YA fantasy. Now I'm not sure about you, but fantasy to me is kind of like the ultimate wintry genre. Winter to me is the perfect time to sink my teeth into either a chunky, dense, high epic fantasy where I can just take my time and slowly meander through it. It's the perfect time to pick up maybe an easier fantasy and just kind of easily get lost into the world. I think it kind of harkens back to things like Harry Potter or the Chronicles of Narnia where you're in this very magical world and I love books that can kind of give me similar vibes or at least suck me into the world making me forget about reality. So I'm just going to kind of run through some books here that I feel would be great to read during the winter season and what I also really think are great about these stories is that I would all consider these books great introductory fantasy. So if you are brand new to the fantasy genre and you are looking to dip your toes into it I would recommend all of these books to start out with because first of all they are all young adult and I feel like young adult is always the perfect place to start with fantasy. That is where I started with fantasy. Actually some of these books are what helped me fall in love with the fantasy genre to begin with and to me there is nothing better than sitting curled up cozy on the couch maybe next to a fire with a kitty cat on your lap and a warm beverage and just getting sucked into a new fantasy world. So first obviously A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J Mass and I mean even on this dust jacket you can see the wintry scene around her because I do believe that in the very early part of this book it is set in the winter time when our main girl Feyre she is immortal and she is out trying to hunt for her family and she kills a wolf that ends up being a fey shifter and so as kind of punishment she is being taken into the fey realm by Tamlin who is prince of the spring court basically and it goes from there. This is a Beauty and the Beast retelling. It is the first book in her A Court of Thorns and Roses series which currently has four full books and a novella. It is one of the very first fantasies that I ever remember reading and really enjoying and I can kind of credit this for pushing me along in my fantasy journey and I always will recommend this series for sure. I also have The Cruel Prince by Holly Black which follows our main character Jude Duarte who is also a human and one day this fey man comes and kills her parents and takes her and her sisters back to the realm of the fey and there's a reason why all of that happened but basically Jude is raised by the man that killed her human parents and it's really about Jude trying to fight her way in the fey world because she is human, she is picked on, she goes through a lot of trials and tribulations but her ultimate goal is I think to be part of like the king's guard or some type of military figure and she is ruthless, she is cunning and she is willing to do whatever she can to get to that point. This is all about her and her relationship with Cardin, the cruel prince, one of the sons of the king and there are definitely a lot of great politics that go on in here as well. So this is definitely a book that has a lot of political maneuvering and of course there's kind of like a relationship that develops between Jude and Cardin. This is certainly one of my favorite YA fantasy series. I absolutely love this one and this is another one that you can just really get sucked into and really enjoy Jude and Cardin as characters and all of the shenanigans that they go through. Of course I could not do a winter recommendation video but included YA fantasy without talking about Six of Crows. This is a book basically about a group of misfits, a found family, and they are kind of criminals and it is about a big heist that they pull off and this heist definitely takes place in a very cold wintry Russia inspired atmosphere. So this certainly is one that will give you all of the winter vibes. I absolutely love the characters. If you have watched the Shadow and Bone adaptation on Netflix you will have met a lot of the characters that are featured in this because that series decided to combine the Grisha trilogy with the Six of Crows duology so you may already be familiar with them. But this is another one that I really credit with getting me into fantasy. So this is another one that I would recommend. And then the last one that I want to recommend is actually another Beauty and the Beast retelling, A Curse So Dark and Lonely by Bridget Kemmerer. So this is a book that follows two main characters. We obviously have Prince Wren. He has been cursed by a sorcerer to relive the autumn of his 18th year over and over and over again, trying to get somebody to fall in love with him. And if somebody does not fall in love with him, he will turn into a hideous beast that basically ravages their world of Emberfall. 
And by the time this book opens, I think he has already lived somewhat like 200 autumns or something like that. And his kingdom is basically completely destroyed. It is basically just him and Grey, who is kind of the leader of his king's guard at this point. And it is Grey's responsibility to go and find him a woman who could potentially fall in love with him. And so at the start of the story, he goes to Washington DC and he meets Harper and he brings Harper back to Emberville against her will, of course. And it's about Harper's relationship with Ren and getting her to try to break the curse. I just love the world. I love the characters, especially Grey. Um, now I have complicated feelings about where Bridget Kimmerer took his storyline, but this is still one of my favorite fantasy series of all time. And like I said, absolutely fantastic for beginners. Highly recommend if you're looking to get into the fantasy genre, this is a fantastic place to start. All right, y'all. And this last stack of books that I'm going to talk to you about today actually all has something in common in that they all kind of fall under the magical realism slash speculative fiction genre. There's just something about the dark whimsy that is contained in these books that is inherently atmospheric and lends itself to a winter read. And so that's why I wanted to include all of these here today because I really do feel like with all of these books, no matter what season they are being set in, that you are still getting the vibes necessary that you would be able to enjoy these in the winter, cozy it up by a fireplace. And of course, y'all know that I have to start this section of the recommendation video with probably one of the most beloved and well-known magical realism stories out there, The Night Circus by Aaron Morgenstern. This is a very lyrical story that follows a magical circus and you never know when or where it's going to appear. It just appears without notice. And so this is following the people within the circus, but it's primarily following two magicians, Celia and Marco, who have basically been groomed from birth to be competitors against each other. And they are supposed to kind of fight to the death with their magic, essentially. And this is following them and their developing relationship and developing romance. This is certainly a very whimsical story. It is, like I said, a very lyrical story. So there's definitely some flowery writing styles in here. This is a very, very beloved book. And I really do feel like it is the perfect story to read this time of year. So if you have not read The Night Circus yet, I would recommend giving it a try. But I do admit that it is not necessarily accessible to everybody. As somebody who has problems with like abstractness and overly metaphorical and purple prose, I struggled with this one a little bit and it could certainly do with a reread, I'm not going to lie. But if this is your type of story, if you think that you could absolutely jive with the writing style, I would absolutely recommend giving this a shot. I am certainly glad that I read this and can understand absolutely why so many people adore this story. And it is really the perfect read for this time of year. Next, I actually want to recommend both of Adrian Young's adult novels, Spells for Forgetting and The Unmaking of Jean Farrow. Now, I actually just finished this story. I haven't even wrapped it up on my channel yet. So you're going to kind of get a little bit of a sneak peek on my thoughts. So even though the main stories of these books are completely unrelated, there are definitely a lot of parallels that are going through them. There are speculative aspects to both of them. Each one kind of contains a little bit of a second chance romance. There are definitely complicated family dynamics and drama throughout the story. And I absolutely loved both of them. So The Unmaking of June Farrow follows our main character, June Farrow, and she is determined to be the last of the pharaohs because she comes from a line of women who are said to be cursed. Every single pharaoh woman has only one daughter. And as they kind of go through life, they start losing their minds. They have hallucinations, delusions, and eventually this kills them. And so June is determined. She's never going to have children. She's never going to continue this line. It is going to end with her. But after her grandmother finally passes away of the curse, she starts to learn things about the curse that she never knew before. Secrets that have been held for her entire life. And it's a little bit more complicated than she originally expected. And I don't want to say more about what the speculative element is because I actually do believe that that's part of the journey of the story. But basically part of the hallucinations that June and all of the women in this family experience is a red door that will pop up out of nowhere. And one day June makes the decision to walk through that door and absolutely everything changes. Now this one takes place entirely during the summer. I promise you that if you are reading this story, this is perfect for this time of year. I kind of liken this story with a combination of fried green tomatoes. And I've been trying to figure out what else I would combine this with. But this is definitely giving me some fried green tomatoes vibes. If you have seen the movie or read the book, then you may be able to understand what I'm talking about here. And I love that movie and the small town Southern atmosphere. And that's exactly where this book is taking place in small town Jasper, North Carolina. So I certainly recommend this. And speaking of small towns, this is actually set off of an island in the Pacific Northwest called Searsha. And Searsha is deeply rooted in ancestral folklore and magic. This is following our main character, Emily Blackwood. And she has basically lived on the island for almost the entirety of her life. And she runs her family shop that does tea leaf readings and sells tea and things like that. And at the start of the story, Emery can kind of sense that something is coming because all of the leaves on all of the trees have changed instantly overnight. And the starlings, which typically leave at the first side of winter, have hung around. So she knows that there is something coming. And lo and behold, August Salt, who has been away from the island for 14 years, has returned. August Salt was kind of driven away from the island 14 years ago because Emery's best friend at the time was murdered and August Salt was the prime suspect. And so he 
and his mother kind of fled the island and he never said anything to Emery. They were in a serious relationship. They were going to run away together and get off of the island once and for all. But he basically up and abandoned Emery and now he is returning because his mother has passed away and he needs to scatter her ashes there. And so August Salt is kind of returning for a reckoning. He knows that nobody wants him there and he knows that he has deep wounds that he needs to heal with Emery. And after he returns, a lot of deeply held secrets are revealed. So there's a lot of betrayal. There are a lot of complicated dynamics that come with living in a small town and that is definitely also a theme that runs through the unmaking of June Pharaoh as well. Both of these take place in an extremely small town where everybody knows each other, where everybody kind of just lives for generations and you see the complications that come with that in both of these stories. So like I said, there are definitely parallels between the two but the stories could not be more different. This is definitely more witchy in nature. Like I said, the island itself is definitely rooted in ancestral folklore and magic. It is kind of a character unto itself. It's basically sentient. It is definitely more reminiscent of the autumnal winter seasons whereas the unmaking of June Pharaoh is set in the summer but like I said you're getting the dark whimsical magical realism vibes that are perfect for the winter time. And speaking of darkly whimsical wonderful stories that encompass the vibes of winter wayward by Amelia Hart. The beauty of this book the power of this book absolutely snuck up on me and became one of my favorite books of this year that I wasn't expecting. It follows three different women over three vastly different time periods. Following one in the 1600s kind of during the height of the witch trials and you're following one in the early 1900s and then one in present day and their connection is that they all kind of come from the same family line and all of the timelines are not really directly connected in any other way but the events in one timeline seep through to kind of influence the events in the future timelines as their main also connection is that they are deeply connected to nature. They have a deep love and respect for nature and they are kind of able to communicate and commune with nature and that is what makes this book so incredibly atmospheric. And what this also is ultimately about is what women have to endure at the hands of men, what they have to do to survive, and the power of women when they actually work together and help each other. I just love this one so much. I think that this was deeply atmospheric and it certainly works for this time of year for sure. And another one that I actually just recently read, but y'all know how much I loved it deeply and I also do feel like it really encompasses the vibe that you're looking for this time of year, Darling House by Alexi Harrow, another piece of speculative slash magical realism. This follows our main character Opal and she currently lives in Eden, Kentucky, which is a small dying town that nobody wants to live in and nobody wants to go to and she is kind of desperate to get her younger brother out. She's been his caretaker for many years since their mother died and she feels very responsible for him. She's doing whatever she can to get him out. This town is really not known for very much but a lot of people know of Starling House. Now this is a house that was built by E. Starling who was kind of an eccentric reclusive person who penned this very dark children's story that became very famous after she went missing. So nobody ever really knew what happened to her but her children's story blew up. It was written in the late 1800s. It's still popular in the time of the story and she had built Starling House and the house was just kind of as eccentric as she was and people kind of leave it alone. They don't really like to talk about it but our main character Opal has always been fascinated by Starling House and she has been dreaming of it ever since she was I want to say in her teens at some point. So she's always been drawn to it and she kind of passes by it every single day on her way home from work and one day she does and she gets introduced to Arthur Starling who is the current resident and ward of Starling House. They strike up a conversation, things happen and Arthur actually offers her a position as the housekeeper of Starling House because the house is kind of falling apart. It's getting decrepit. Arthur is not really taking all that great of care of it and the house is unhappy. As you can kind of imagine, the house and the story is definitely a character unto itself. It is sentient and it really wants Opal there and it's going to do everything in its power to get Opal to come in and stay. So you're following Opal as she takes the job. She doesn't really understand why she took this job from somebody she doesn't know but it's going to pay her a lot more money and so she takes the job as the caretaker and she starts to bring the house back to life. And so this is a story about her getting to know Arthur and it's also a developing love story between the two and it was so beautiful and charming and I absolutely love the love story in this more than in a lot of romances that I read y'all. That's how much I loved Arthur and Opal in this story and of course Opal is getting to know Starling House and Starling House is absolutely loving her and you're kind of figuring out why Starling House was built in the first place and it kind of goes from there. Not Basically Arthur is a tortured man with a destiny and he's kind of determined to be the last ward of Starling House. He doesn't want anybody to share his same fate. He is going to end it and then Opal comes along and as much as Arthur tries to push her away she's like no I'm going to stay and I'm going to help you and you kind of find out all about Starling House, why it exists, why it was built, and what exactly Arthur is trying to protect Opal and the town from. And there is definitely a fairy tale esque situation with this story. And as we get further along into the story and we start to understand more about what happened to East Starling and why she built Starling House, you're getting into the more fairy tale aspects of it. But I still thought that it was done incredibly well. I didn't really lose my connection to the story overall. I liked the direction that Alex C. E. Harrow took it, and it really didn't put me off the fairy tale nature of it. But because of that fairy tale nature of it, I do actually feel like that just adds to the overall vibes that you're looking 
looking for for the winter season. And this is definitely set in a chunk of time during the winter season. Like I believe at least the first couple of chapters are set in like the January, February timeline. So you are certainly getting those winter scenes in there as well. And like I said, I love the story so much and I will always recommend. And I think the very last book that I have here today is definitely one that has all of the winter vibes. It actually has winter in the title. It is another YA and that is Winterwood by Shay Earnshaw. And to be honest with you, um, I actually think Shay Earnshaw's books in general kind of encompass a lot of the themes and the vibes that I was talking about here. I do think A History of Wild Places would also be a very good recommendation for that. I think it actually does kind of give a lot of similar vibes to some of Adrian Young's stories as well. But I did choose to pick this up because again, I mean, look at this y'all. Like I said, this is a young adult story that follows our main character, Nora Walker. And everybody says that she is a witch and that she comes from a long line of witches. And she and her family actually have a deep connection to the woods that surround their area. And it is this deep connection that leads Nora Walker to find Oliver. Uh, he is a boy that actually went missing from the boys camp that exists like across the lake. And so she's out in the woods one day and she finds him. And he actually went missing during the worst snowstorm that they've seen in years. And he should be dead, but he's not. He's very much alive. But Nora's connection to the woods lets her know that something is off. Something is not quite right. The woods are kind of uneasy at Oliver's presence. And as she grows to know and care about Oliver, she realizes that she really has to uncover what actually happened to Oliver in the woods. Why did he go missing in the first place? What happened? And she's going to uncover that truth. And of course, Oliver has some secrets of his own. And I just really enjoyed this one. And like I said, it is all of the winter vibes. It is set in the winter. There's snow. There's creepy woods. It has all of the things. And I just recommend Shay Earnshaw in general, but specifically for winter, this one for sure. All right, everybody, that is it. Those are some books that I feel would be great to read during the winter time. Please comment down below and let me know some of the books that you would recommend for winter or some of your favorite books or type of books that you would love to read during the winter season. And if you have made it to the end of this video, but you are not feeling chatty, please go ahead and leave me a winter related emoji. Maybe you'll leave me a snowflake or an icicle or some rain. Whatever you would like to leave me, please feel free to leave it down below. I always love seeing your comments and it absolutely helps my channel so very much. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I am participating in Bookmas and so that means from December 1st through December 25th, you are supposed to get one upload from me a day, hopefully. And I would sure love to connect with you in any of those videos. You know that I love connecting with you there or on any of my other social media platforms, which I always leave linked down below along with any of the books that I talked about in these videos. But until next time, y'all, bye.